Um, very short background. I've been a programmer for quite some time. Um, over the years, I came from DBase more or less full time, and currently I'm happy enough to uh, to be a Grails developer full time. I've even spent a few years in PHP. Uh, the menu is a bit uh, random. Uh, I want to introduce a bit of the tools that we uh, use in our daily development. Um, and then a lot of the design uh, we, we currently use is based around abstract domain. Something about scaffolding. Um, a design we use multilingualization, how we make data uh, entered by our clients uh, available in multilanguages. And uh, at the end, if, we, if the time uh, is enough, I want to show something about how we connect to an API. It's something I uh, did trying some work on a plugin. Uh, the webs of choice. Um, we're a company that uh, all of our employees work from home. So we tend to have a lot of tools that, that work in the cloud, that is currently uh, called. So we use uh, Google Docs. Uh, Fogbox is an issue management tool that we use a lot. Um, we made a small adjustment on it so that we can have uh, user stories. And does that work? Yeah. So we, we introduced a new category for Fogbox user stories and has a couple of uh, custom fields. But uh, we, we like it a lot. We use it for all our issues and also for uh, user stories and backlogs and Kanban boards and things like that. Uh, Balsamic is a funny tool we use for, for designing. Uh, we're not a graphic design company. We we tend to hire <laughs> we tend to hire uh, people to do uh, actually graphic designs, but we do a lot of uh, user and interaction designs, or we want to present designs in uh, uh, when we make uh, proposals to customers. And the funny thing about uh, Balsamic is that, that it doesn't look like a finished product. You can have a click through demo, and it's still the, the, the customer is always aware that still a lot of work has to be done. It still looks like a sketch. Um, since we're uh, uh, all distributed people, um, we have a funny tool, actually. Uh, I already said we're not graphic designers, so it looks a bit strange. But it's, it's like an internal uh, Twitter, uh, a Twitter server where we have all our communications on uh, all our projects going on. So you, you can have a look what your, custom, what your uh, colleagues are doing. So we have uh, check-ins from, uh, from Jenkins, we have things going on in Fogbox, we have people saying something. And uh, well, it's actually something we use internally a lot. It's, yeah, it's a, an important channel for communications. Um, yeah, one of the things, it's just to the, to the right of the slide, uh, we have a Google Hangouts is a thing that we use a lot currently. And, um, yeah, we can see which people are in Google Hangouts. So if you want to join a Hangout, just like we have a coffee machine Hangout, so you can see, oh, my colleagues are talking about the weekend, and I want to join them. So that's something we like a lot. But back to business. Um, one of the, the, the important things um, we use in our designs is an abstract domain. That's a really a groovy kind of way to do it, but it helps us a lot. Um, a simplified view of the type of applications we mostly built, or at least we mostly built with this architecture. We have a database, a couple of services, and typically two portals uh, talking to the, to, to the logic. So the, the one thing on the, uh, on the upper right is, is used by our clients, is typically the back end of the application. And um, the, the portal on the, on the uh, lower right is where the consumers come in, typically the clients of our clients. And uh, the front-end portal is, is uh, we usually hire a graphical designer to do, do a really nice design which fits uh, our clients since we're programmers and, well, we're visually uh, not that very good. Um, I have an example application to describe a bit from how it will work. It's, it's, uh, it's called Great Tunes. And it's meant to take over the world of iTunes. Kind of albums, items, and artists. If you put some properties in, then, well, you have titles, descriptions, images, so you can, can make up the things that will be going on there. Um, using an abstract domain probably isn't too groovy, but it helps us a lot. And, and one of the things we uh, considered 
of doing it this way is, is it's old school object oriented design. And so there are a lot of people, a lot of developers, a lot of uh, people that will maintain the code that, de that we deliver that immediately, immediately will uh, understand what abstract domain does and, and how they can change it. Um, yesterday saw, we saw some nice uh, presentation about AST uh, transformations. Probably can do similar things. Um, but it will be very hard to, to deliver that to a maintenance, uh, a maintenance party at our clients, which are core Java developers or something like that. So we decided to, to use an abstract domain. And uh, well, Grills helps us a lot because it just picks it up and generates all the stuff that you come up with there. Put in some attributes. A nice one is a remark attribute. So each and every record has a remark. And in the user interface, in the, that's the backend user interface that our clients will be using, will typically have something that will look like a yellow note, so a, a remark. It's appreciated a lot, and it's a really simple thing to, to introduce. Same goes for status. It's yeah, well, it's just a straightforward uh, enumeration. It has, we have uh, four kinds of statuses. Something is active, a record can be inactive, archived, which is meant to be reused at a later stage, or trashed, which has to be trashed. So then we use a, like a, a Hibernate plugin that, that uh, filters each and every record that goes to, uh, to GORM. And then it's very easy. So, so you say in the back end, well, we only want to see by default the active and the inactive records. So that's the, the, the record set that the client typically will be working on. And the front end only has to see the active uh, records. Very simple, straightforward solution, but it gives a lot of power uh, to the user so they, they can shuffle around with records and make changes and put things in archive, and it works a lot. It shows something like this in the back end, so you, you can filter on a, on a status. And since you know what a status is, you can have these nice little icons. So, so there's an inactive record and an, and an active record. And you can have a couple of functions already to, to change uh, the different records. Uh, uh, these uh, user interfaces are all generated using scaffolding, but I will come back at it uh, later in the presentation. So the actual implementation of the, of the filter, uh, well, it says if, if params filter underscore status, so if, if the user interface actually tries to, uh, to um, introduce another status, uh, then we'll, we'll use that status, and otherwise we'll use the default filter. So it's, it's like well, two or three lines of code. Uh, inherit all your domain classes from, uh, from the abstract domain. And we have a lot of workflow-like uh, functionality available on each and every record that the client uses. So things like that. If you, if you filter on active record, oh, well, you can disable the buttons to put things active and, and give some, uh, yeah, it gives a complete and polished feeling to uh, to use interface, and it's always the same. If you want to trash something, you first have to select the trashed records, and then an empty trash button comes up. Well, it's a, it's a bit uh, inspired, like for, for uh, by content management systems like Typo Tree or Joomla, or which I've done in the past too. Another funny thing in there is a, is a change, um, a reference to a change record. It, it holds a, a, well, a similar record, which is abstract domain because it's all inheritance from there. And we use that like a, a mutation record. So um, if you want to have a future change uh, for object, you can uh, just already put it there. Um, what is used more often is that uh, there's like a division of res responsibility. So one client, one user has to change things, but another user has to uh, accept the change before it actually becomes available. In the database, it's again really straightforward. It's just another record and another Hibernate filter to prevent these, uh, these change records to be displayed among the other records. And then you have, can have a new change that has to be accepted by a user before it becomes effective. Since uh, all these default things are uh, available in all our uh, domain records, 
we uh, tend to trust on heavy duty scaffolding. Um, I'm a bit scared to say anything about Venkat's uh, presentations because they were really marvelous. But one of the things he said, well, uh, scaffolding is just if you're lazy and then you can show quickly uh, what the effects of a design or a domain objects will be. But we tend to think very differently. We have invested really a lot of time to come up with heavy duty scaffolding. So um, most of the time, especially uh, all, of the all of the things we've done in the back end just can be generated and regenerate it, and, and uh, if we put on new, new uh, attributes, they will be there in a production system and not just as a talk piece in a sprint or something like uh, was suggested. <coughs> um, yeah, well, the substantial amount of time is, is um, spent there, but it's reused in each and every product because, well, since it's a back end for the client, it's not that important that it looks. Um, it has a business uh, colors or, or things like that. We can do, of course, things with CSS, but um, the, the actual front end is where the, the clients of our clients will be dealing with and that, that we don't use the scaffolding there. Controls are always scaffold, so there's a lot of uh, default uh, methods that will be there. All the methods that, uh, for changing statuses and uh, putting uh, change records aside and, uh, and Accepting change records, all this behavior is in the is uh, in the scaffolded controllers, but it's not visible if you're uh, developing the system unless you want to change something. And the views are scaffolded as a start because well, there's always things you want to change, uh, uh, which fields are on which row and which column and things like that. And uh, I will show. Uh, uh, we have a couple of settings in the domain classes that influence the way things are scaffolded. So this is how a controller looks like. And uh, well, the rest is, is, uh, is under the hood. It's, it's generated by Grails. If you do want to do something different, well, you only have to uh, reintroduce the method that you want to change for this particular class. We have, um, two kinds of flows. This one is simpler than, than the scaffolds that are uh, defaulting grills. Just have a list state and an edit state. So you have a few uh, records like uh, tax codes and, and money and uh, simpler entities that we use simple flow. Uh, what we introduce are a, a couple of extra safe options to make uh, entry of text uh, quicker. It, uh, it saves the user one round trip to the server if you can save and create a new record. So slightly quicker than, uh, than entering a new record after save. And this is like a diagram of the, 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 the actual scaffolding that's in, uh, in Grails. It has a, also a list state. And again, yeah, the extra methods from save and create, save and close. So that's um, yeah, all the extra things that, that will be in a controller are typically added here. So all the controls look like this, and, and it looks like this. And you will, if you want to have extra things in the controller, then um, yeah, that's the only thing you have to see as a developer. So um, the views, those are the things that are most likely to be changed, should to be changed. Um, the, the order of fields on a, on, a, on a screen is influenced by the order they are in the constraints of the domain class. It's almost the same as in uh, default grills. I don't know where my image is, but uh, what we do use is we use um, a couple of new artifacts. So we render this underscore form, underscore table, and underscore panel which do the actual fields that are, gonna, that are created. Whereas the, the list and all the, the, the similar methods in scaffolding stay the same, but they use these fields. This uh, list.csv is a funny thing we use. So, so on each and every screen, you can export the current view to Excel. And uh, the order of the fields and the way they are formatted is in this CSV files, which are created. So just an example, you don't, you don't want to read all the code, but it, this underscore panel thing, it's, it's, it's like a little panel that gives a, a quick overview of one entity. 
and we render something like this. And then it's up to the user to, it's up to the developer to, uh, to create a, a good version of the panel for this particular uh, application. So actually what you're working on is typically something like this. The, the rest of the views is, is scaffolded and you don't, you don't change it or you hardly ever change it. But these are the things you will always custom made to, uh, yeah, to the design and the properties of your, uh, of your domain. You don't want to reinvent yourself or, or do things duplicate. So this is a, a, the underscore uh, a table file. It's where the list is created from. It has just a, a simple if uh, statement that says, well, if you're in list mode, which is the upper left, you have to render a couple of more columns than if you're used as a reference in a, in a master detail relation. And you skip a couple of columns. And for also for the user, um, he recognizes it's the same record because all the, the things are formatted the same way and all the columns are in the same order. And these are the, the, the settings. So the, the first setting is, well, do you want to render simple flow or uh, the more default flow for this uh, domain class? And uh, which fields do you want to have a filter on? Well, which is always stata status. And types and categories is something I want to talk about later. And which fields do you want to have in search? So if you filter on, on uh, the fields you want to filter on, you have, uh, it, it results in these, these filters. These are tech clips, of course, that will be generated in the list uh, file. But if you, if you add a new filter in the domain class and you, you uh, restart the application, you will have new filters here. I think it's doing a bit funny, but... Um, something we call multilingualization. It's not exactly the correct term, but um, you have like translation of the program code that's usually known as internationalization, and that's in Grail, so that's not, we don't do uh, very different things there. But what we do, we typically have a properties file for a group of domain classes. So we have like an albums property in this example or a message property. But it's all the same. But what we call multilingualization is a translation of the data record. So what um, all the records that, that, that are entered in the system, like a product, can be translated in a, in a Danish version of the product. quite simple design uh, for that. Uh, we have, uh, of course, a language table. Uh, one of the languages is uh, marked as the, what is the system language. Most of our clients use either English or Dutch. Uh, so that's the, the default language in which they order all their, their records. And there's, an, uh, uh, in this case, an album, a multilingualization table. And it, it just contains just the properties of the album table that you want to have translated. And then again, the, the, the scaffolding generates all the fields, all the views to do this. So it checks if you have already have a translation in that language and you don't translate the default language and all that kind of stuff is, is in, in scaffolding. It's optionally, um, if, you, if you don't translate the record, you will be served the, the records that are in the album. If there is a translation that we try to serve you the, the language of your choice. Um, scaffolding uses uh, what is nowadays called by convention. It just looks, is, is the domain name ending in multilingualization? Then I'll use slightly different rendering because this needs a different kind of controller and needs a different kind of uh, view. In the end, it looks something like this in the database. Um, some fields you don't want to uh, you don't want to translate, so things like uh, years typically not translated, so it will will not be available in the album translation table. Uh, references to other fields are not overlaid, and relations are not overlaid. That could be a problem if you want to have a, a, a reference to another uh, another record based on a, a different language or 
this could not be a, a, a good solution for you. But uh, so far, we use this, and um, uh, there are workarounds for it, of course. All the records that, that should be entered in the language or in the translation table should should, for, should be for languages that are not the system language. So all these kind of con constraints are very easy to implement with Grills, you just say. It's just a constraint on a table and, and that will work for you and you keep a consistent set of data. So again, this comes from the abstract domain. So if you want to have a title, we have a getter for the title and said, well, uh, there's a service that, that tries to figure out uh, which kind of title to serve. So then the abstract domain goes to the service and asks, do you have a translation for title? So in, it can figure out if an overlay exists. Is there an M17 table for this, uh, uh, for this domain? What is the system language? It can ask it for, from the system language table and we cache that, of course, for performance reasons. And what is the requested language? You can take it from session. Uh, but what we, what we do have in our application is that the user can, can uh, manually choose which language it has. So the, the language of his browser or operating system is just the default, and the user can override it. And if there's no translation available, we just give back the original uh, language, the untranslated record, because now well, that's probably what you want to, want to see. Um, the last thing in this um, scaffolding thing is uh, uh, what we call types and categories. Just a couple of terms we chose. Um, types are things that are hard coded in the system. You have like um, different types of products, and uh, based on what type of products you're, you're using, the, the program will, will change differently. So, this is a, is a hard coded thing. Uh, and these are implemented as, uh, as uh, enumerables. And we have categories, which is just a uh, yeah, flavor for, for clients. We don't do anything with it as, a, as programmers, but it's just a category that you, you have available for all the records and, and it's uh, used intensively in the, in the user interface for filtering and color coding stuff and fancy things like that. So for an item, we can have an item category, which actually inherits from a different category. So all the fields are always the same there. And um, uh, one of the funny things on the category is we use a, a, a color type. So that color can we pick up as for CSS and render things in different colors. And well, the, the, the user can, can uh, choose which categories he wants to introduce. Uh, categories can be uh, in a hierarchy with other categories. They can have different colors. It's, it's all up to the user, and it's all default in the program code that's generated. Uh, so this is typically an example of a type. iTunes will behave quite differently if it, if it's music or if it's a movie or if it's a book. The user can, if it, if it uh, enters a new item, the user can choose well what type of thing it is. It can't add types, obviously. So this one simple item table actually has a couple of more tables in the system to have all this default behavior. But well, we're quite happy with it, and hopefully some of you think well, there are some nice things in there. Something really different. Uh, but also some code we use. Um, I've been working on a, a plugin, which is more more like a hobby thing. But uh, in a way, we, we uh, test out some code that we want to use in, in other uh, connectors, other AP, uh, APIs we use. Uh, my colleague will have a presentation uh, just after the uh, for a completely different kind of system we use, but it all depends on a lot of APIs. and calling different systems, so it's just a funny playground. It's a Flickr as a REST API, so the plugin will be lost uh, uh, on the next version of uh, Grails, probably. So then we have a GORM uh, REST implementation, but 
the approach of, of wrapping an API is probably uh, uh, going to exist uh, after that. Very abstract, what do, you, what do you want to do? Well, you have to validate uh, the parameters that you need to do a particular call to an API. You have to do the actual call to the API and see if that works, if they got done, can have uh, 404 errors or things like that. And process the response. You have to see what's, what's coming back. If it's an error, is it, is it actually data? Reshuffle it in the way you have, uh, want to have the data. So in sort of code, it looks like this. You have an API call. There's no which method to call on which uh, parameters. It has to, the, the parameters have to be validated. And then you try to do the actual call to, uh, to uh, process outside and raise exceptions if something goes wrong. So this is more like the actual code. We have an, an interface that describes an API method and that contains a couple of closures to do the, the parameters, the, the, the validator, the processor and the, the actual error handling. So for, for each uh, API method, we have uh, an implementation of this method and the implementation consists as a, as a couple of closures. So what do you, do you want to do? Sometimes it's just pass a parameter, the other time you have to convert things and but that's all in individual classes and it goes through this uh, handling of the call. So an example of such an implementation, well, it calls an API method which is, uh, is an endpoint name it needs, to, it needs to know. Then the validation in this, in this example is quite simple. You have to pass a parameter or an object that contains the parameter and the actual parameter that this call needs is, is an ID field. And this is the, the actual implementation of this particular method. It just does a call to get the information on a particular ID. If it, if it doesn't validate, you pass false and something to log. Otherwise, it validates. The next step is, is uh, process it. So if the call uh, was successful, you want to process what comes back. In this case, we use uh, GPath to process the response to, to go over XML uh, response we have. And uh, it's a simple uh, assignment. From we want to store the, the result in a couple of properties. And uh, for each individual property, we have a, a GPath to pick it up. So it's, it's, it's all straightforward and it's all in um, yeah, at one place implemented for the different uh, methods. Errors, error handling, so you can have error response from, from the API you call. And it can be different for each individual method, so that's how we implement it here. So in this case, there are a couple of errors that we say, well, these are recoverable things. So something is probably wrong with the internet connection or the API tells you something. And we give back a slightly different error, a slightly different exception. And if it's not recoverable, if the programmer that's using this code is doing something wrong, we give a syntax exception. So we have a generic implementation, of course. Um, we, can, we have a, a class for each and every method to, to implement the call. The parameters are more or less groovy-like. And what is nice to, to tie together. So the, the server says, well, I can have a, a, a photo by ID. I do the call and give the, the, the method implementation and the parameters. So for, for the, the people that use the service, it's, well, it's just groovy classes and they have to set groovy properties to it. And um, the whole handling of the API is, uh, is abstracted from them. Somewhat quicker, I noticed on the, the laptop, but let's say it's a wrap. That's, uh, that's the code I wanted to show you and hope some of it stick and uh, sticks and inspires you. I don't know if there are any questions or
comments or things that I said blatantly wrong or no. Then I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs> You can reach me on a couple of ways. I'm not that active on Twitter, but I will read what's dropped there. Thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you, Edwin. The uh, next talk is in here in uh, 10 to 3, in half an hour, and that